opening up on global business. China's foreign exchange reserves contracted 0.88% in May on a monthly basis, the first decline in over three months. The U.S. trade deficit widened sharply in April as imports of goods rebounded. China's college entrance exam, or Gaokao, commenced on Wednesday, and around 13 million students are taking the exam nationwide. From CTTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Lily Lu. Let's start today with our top story. The first forum on building up China's cultural strength has opened in South China city of Shenzhen. President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory message to the forum, highlighting the Communist Party of China's commitment to cultural development. In his letter, the president emphasized the need to strengthen cultural confidence, adhere to openness and inclusivity, maintain the correct and innovative cultural principles, inspire the entire nation's cultural creativity, and promote exchanges and mutual learning among human civilizations. China's foreign exchange reserves saw an almost 0.9% drop in the month of May on a monthly basis to nearly 3.2 trillion US dollars. According to the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, the decline is attributed to the higher US dollar index in May as well as the combined effect of exchange rate conversion and asset price changes. However, it is worth noting that China's economic performance has recently been improving and recovering, which has helped to maintain the basic stability of foreign exchange reserves. Furthermore, China's gold reserves have maintained steady growth for the seventh consecutive month in May. Let's move on to China's foreign trade. According to the General Administration of Customs, China's foreign trade volume during the first five months of this year rose by 4.7 percent year-on-year, reaching 16.8 trillion yuan, or 2.4 trillion U.S. dollars. Exports accounted for 9.6 trillion yuan, up over 8 percent on a yearly basis, while imports surpassed 7 trillion yuan, registering a 0.5 percent year-on-year increase. ASEAN contributed to China's largest trading partner and accounting for over 15 percent of the country's total foreign trade value. And besides, imports and exports to countries along the Belt and Road Initiative reached nearly 6 trillion yuan. That is a 13 percent young year growth. Numerous Chinese cities have been sending business delegations abroad seeking trade opportunities. Beijing has been one of them. Our reporter Ho Jing has more. The business delegation's visit will be largely focused on four areas, financial services, manufacturing, technology, and innovation. The delegation, which is expected to start its trip on June the 10th, will look to build on the partnerships formed during the 2023 China Arab Entrepreneur Summit held in Dubai last month. That uh, uh, many of our entrepreneurs, they found this trip is uh, very meaningful, and they find their potential partner, and some of them, they have a contract already. This market is very, is very uh, promising. And the first is uh, it's big. The second, the local government they have the budget. And the third, you know, the local people and the you know Middle East entrepreneurs are eager to cooperate. The cooperation with Middle Eastern partners goes beyond trade deals and includes joint ventures that are founded by both sides. Such integration enables both sides to maximize the benefits of these partnerships and create mutually beneficial solutions. At Garwood, New and the King of All Fragrances and the Diamond in Plants has a long history and a significant trading role on the maritime silk road. Today, the largest consumer of at Garwood worldwide is the Middle East with an annual consumption of over 1 billion yuan, comprising two-thirds of the global market. In response to this opportunity, Taiyue Holdings has established a joint venture with Essa Al Gurir in Dubai to build a factory and expand production capacity. Additionally, a flagship store will soon open at the Dubai Mall and the UAE airport. Meanwhile, foreign enterprises and investors are also looking at setting up bases in Chaoyang District in Beijing due to the conducive living and business environment it offers. In the first quarter of 2023, 87 foreign enterprises were founded in Chaoyang District, taking nearly one-fourth of the total amount. 
Over 1.05 billion U.S. dollars of foreign investment was utilized. That is almost 20 percent of the city's total foreign investment. We did a lot of service to the senior managers. Uh, you know, it's very details. For example, uh, the baby go to the international school, and uh, we take care of their you know tax refund for the senior managers, uh, etc. But also, I think the foreign investment enterprises have a lot of confidence on China market. The second, I think we can invite them, the foreign friends, can be our uh, publicity ambassadors to uh, persuade or can influence uh, his or her friends to come and see. In addition to the growing relationship between China and the Middle East, cooperation with other countries is also gaining momentum. Recently, CEOs from major companies including Tesla, JP Morgan, and Starbucks have visited China and completed successful trips. Their actions speak volumes about the impressive potential of the Chinese market and their confidence in China's business environment. Hou Jing, CGTN, Beijing. And for more insights on China's latest foreign exchange reserves data, we are now joined by Zhou Mi, Senior Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. Mr. Zhou, great to have you on the show. Could you start with uh, elaborating more on the contributing factors to this slip in China's foreign exchange reserves in the month of May? Actually, we know that the Federal Reserve of the United States is increasing its interest rate continuously. So we know that it has a, a very high interest rate, which has attracted many investors to invest in the United States, which has appreciated U.S. dollars while depreciated other kind of currencies. So we know that Chinese foreign reserve has diversified in different assets. So when the, the labeled or you know valued as a foreign currency instead of U.S. dollars, they are depreciated, which is a kind of factors that has. Uh, driven the amount of the Federal Reserve a little bit slip in the in the May. And also some Western media are reporting that China's economic recovery should be uh, maybe slowing down based on May's foreign trade numbers. However, the World Bank has recently revised up its growth forecast for China's economy this year. What is your outlook for China's trade and the general economy going forward? Actually, when we're talking about the trend of the trade, I, I, I think that we should put it at uh, China's trade in the international market, which not only look at Chinese market itself. Well, in this, uh, the, uh, the first uh, five months of this year, we see that Chinese trade has kept on the very stable pace in the increasing. And I don't think that it's a kind of decline in this regard. So we worried about the decline of uh, the foreign market at the beginning of this year, and if it's actually what happened. So I, I think that it's a really a big opportunity for us to reconsider about what we can do to improve and make the trade more sustainable, not only for China, but also for the region and also for the world. And speaking of which, uh, you made a great point. What we need to think about is what we can do. So in terms of trade expansion, what measures has China implemented to optimize its trade structure and environment? Actually, in my understanding, we are not only trying to expand our trade, I mean, without a limit. The world is uh, limited and we have to coordinate with other countries. In this regard, we are not only trying to increase the trade volume, especially for the export. We are trying to improve and trying to adjust the structure of the trade. Actually, for the first several months, we see a lot of uh, improvement or new aspects of uh, export, like for the new energy uh, products, uh, e uh, electrical vehicles, and some new things. So we are trying to reach the market and trying to cooperate with our partners to decide what kind of products we should try to improve, and which is good for the environment and, and uh, adapt adapted to the digital economies cooperation in this time. So indeed, it was not only about expansion, but about a high quality development and expansion. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhou Mi, Senior Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation for us. In the meantime, foreign companies are continuing to send their top executives to China in order to expand their business in the country. Citigroup CEO Jane Fraser recently met with the head of China's financial regulator and expressed the company's full confidence in China's economic growth. And additionally, companies like Subway are announcing major expansion plans in China with nearly 4,000 new openings planned across the country, across the Chinese mainland rather, over the next two decades. And according to its CEO, John Chaitze, China is a key market with significant long-term growth opportunities. 
The World Bank released its latest global economic prospects report on Tuesday, which revealed that major global economies are more resilient than previously thought. As a result, the global economic growth outlook for 2023 has been raised to 2.1 percent, that is up 0.4 percentage points from the earlier projection. And China's annual growth outlook has also been increased to 5.6 percent for this year and 4.6 percent for the next year, while the United States economy is is expected to grow by 1.1 percent this year and slower by 0.8 percent in 2024. While the eurozone is expected to experience growth of 0.4 percent this year and 1.3 percent the next year, Japan's economy is projected to grow by 0.8 percent this year and by 0.7 percent in the next year. And you're watching Global Business still to come here on the program. Trade deficit widened in the United States in the month of April as imports of goods rebounded and exports fell. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. The latest monthly import and export figures from the United States have just been released. And for more on that and how markets are reacting, let's cross over to John Terrett in New York. Hi there, John. Good to see you. Um, so first of all, start by telling us the reactions in, uh, to the trade balance. Hi there, Lily Lou. Well, to be honest with you, when we came in early this morning, it's just after nine o'clock here now, when we came in early this morning, the futures markets were pointing sharply lower. And I think they were lower in Europe where they were actually trading as well. And that was because we got the China trade data in the past couple of hours, showing that exports in China were lower by 7.5%, more than expected, while imports were lower by 4.5% in the month of May, which I think, again, is more than expected. Now, the reason that the futures markets were down was because, of course, if China really is slowing down a little bit that has an enormous effect on economies around the world not least of all this one but especially especially in Europe now here at the moment the markets have all turned green again or only just they're basically flat but they are in the green and that's because we've just had the US balance of trade figure and the trade deficit for April this is the difference between what the United States imports and what it exports It's given a dollar figure and it was 74.6 billion dollars and we've been expecting it to be higher than that at 75.8 billion Nonetheless, that figure of 74.6 represents a jump of 23%, and that is a six-month high in this latest survey just out today. And that is because, as you correctly identified in the intro, that is because imports have rebounded here. So the U.S. is importing more than we anticipated that they would. Now we move on to tomorrow, Thursday, when we get the latest jobs data. And then there's nothing really happening apart from this trade balance now until next Tuesday or Wednesday, when the central bank meet to decide what to do about interest rates. On top of all of this, the OECD, the Paris-based Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, says that it doesn't see much of an uptick, much of a global pickup in the economy in the course of the next year or so. And finally, if I may, just on the diplomatic front, movement here, we're being told here, it's reported that Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, will head to China in the next week or two, maybe to have a meeting with President Xi. Of course, his trip was postponed from earlier this year. And it's all part of President Biden's rapprochement. He mentioned at Hiroshima, at the G7, a couple of weeks ago, that we should expect a coming thaw between D.C. and Beijing. This appears to be a part of that. As you reported, Lily Lu, just now, Jane Fraser from Citigroup, the behemoth bank, is in China at the moment and it comes just a week after Elon Musk and Jamie Dimon from the biggest bank in America also visited China. So things are moving a little bit here. Yeah, indeed. And also, John, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen faces a grilling on Capitol Hill today. Give us more details on that, please. 
Yeah, well, you see, the thing is, if you're a politician, you can be summoned by the House or the Senate pretty much at any moment. And Janet Yellen is the Treasury Secretary, but she was appointed by the Democratic Joe Biden. And the House is now controlled by the Republican Party. So they want to try and make some trouble for Janet Yellen, make some hay on the television if they possibly can. So they've summoned her to talk. And she has some what Americans call splaining to do. In other words, explaining to do. Americans say splaining. And that is why she cited June the 1st as the deadline for the U.S. to run out of money had the debt ceiling deal not been done. Now, she later slipped that to June the 5th, as you know, which was last Monday. And it may even have been later than that. And Republicans want to attack her and say, look, you're the Treasury Secretary. You didn't know when your own country was going to run out of money. Meanwhile, we do know the country nearly did run out of money. It was down to well below $30 billion as that deadline approached on Monday. She will also testify about the regional banking crisis that we've recently experienced and talk about the possibility of a credit crunch later in the year, which seems to be looming. Lily Liu? Great stuff. Thank you so much for the updates. John Terrett for us in New York. The United States is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but nearly every major American city struggles with homelessness. It is a problem with no easy answers. CDTN's Jim Spellman introduces us to a woman living on the streets of Washington, D.C. They sit like scars covering open wounds, tents and tarps across American cities like Washington, D.C., each a makeshift shelter for homeless people like Lilia. She says she was once married and worked as a nanny, but after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, she fell into a depression and began experiencing other mental health issues. She lives on the sidewalk near George Washington University, about six blocks from the White House. Like many homeless people, she relies on facilities known as soup kitchens run by the city government or local nonprofits. We survive thanks to the programs, meals, um, services, uh, showers or laundry, which is not enough. I mean, we are many and the, the, the time and the resources are the minimal. And she relies on the kindness of those around her, like Evanson Guerrier. Years after year goes by and we still have this homeless problem here in the city. Well, you know, I'm a New Yorker and I was shocked when I first came down here that, to see homeless living in front of the White House. And I don't know. I mean, some of the homeless people, brothers, just stay in the street. Advocates for homeless people say it's not that simple and that more resources, staffing, and housing options are desperately needed. But there's no doubt it's not easy for many homeless people to hold down a job or live in a shelter. Here in D.C., there are generally empty shelter beds each night. Lilia says she is often offered help, including a bed in a shelter. I already stay in one shelter for women. Um, for two months or something like that. It, 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 it is nice because you have a place where you have a ceiling. They, they were so cool. They were nice, They're, but, but it's not easy. You can have easily conflicts with people. You know, I'm, I'm talking that all of us have many issues and you never know. And you never know what might happen. For decades, cities across the U.S. have struggled with how to end homelessness. But you know, to do that, you need the money. We can help other countries with trades and dollars or get them ideas of military ideas and this and that. But what's up with USA? You know, we here. We need y'all. Homeless people are easy to see, yet invisible to many of us. The sight of homeless people in big cities like Washington, D.C. is so common. It can be easy to walk past tents like these and forget or perhaps ignore the people living in them. Today, tomorrow, and for the foreseeable future, Lilia and the hundreds of thousands of other homeless Americans will focus on one thing. Surviving. All of us have to survive. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Washington. Switching gears to Europe, is that that's Italy's National Statistics Bureau has revised its forecast for the country's economy to 1.2 percent growth this year, and the main driver of this growth is expected to be domestic demand. Our reporter Giles Gibson has more. 
The National Statistics Agency, ESTAT, is saying that domestic spending is a much bigger factor in this improved outlook for the Italian economy than foreign trade. It's also predicting that if energy and food prices continue to decline, then wider inflation is going to go down as well. And of course, if Italians have, uh, have to spend less money on their monthly bills and on their supermarket shopping, then they're also going to have more money to spend in the rest of the Italian economy. Uh, Estat is also forecasting that unemployment is going to fall here in Italy to 7.7% in 2024, although that is still significantly higher than the average across the European Union, which is at around 6%. Now, Giorgia Maloney, the Italian Prime Minister, is approaching her one-year anniversary as Prime Minister and also as custodian of the Italian economy. That's coming up in October of this year and during campaigning she was seen as a real right-wing firebrand uh, pledging to aggressively crack down on immigration for example but since she's gone into a coalition government with Silvio Berlusconi of the Forza Italia party as well as Matteo Salvini of the League party her economic policy has been seen as much more centre-right, doing things like, for example, cutting corporation and income tax. And Giorgia Maloney also has a very big decision to take in the next few months when it comes to the future of the Italian economy and the future of Italian trade, because by the end of this year, she has to decide whether she's going to keep Italy in an agreement that it signed with China back in 2019 to become part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Giles Gibson for CGTN, Rome. Time to check out some other major business headlines from around the world. Australia's economy grew by 2.2%. That's the slowest pace in one and a half years during the first three months of the year. While the weak growth was mainly due to high prices and rising interest rates with indications of further softness in the months ahead. Turkey's lira tumbled as much as 7% to a record 23.16 earlier on Wednesday. That's the biggest daily sell-off since 2021. The currency has been under pressure after the country's president, Tayyip Erdogan, was re-elected in late May. Average house prices in UK slipped by 1% on a yearly basis in May. That's the first year-on-year -year decline in 11 years. Mortgage lenders have in fact said that the weakening demand and higher interest rates may add further pressure on prices. China's college entrance exam, or Gaokao, starts on Wednesday. Around 13 million students are taking the exams nationwide. And this year, the exam is gaining more attention because of questions about whether better education lead to better jobs. Our reporter Luce Ray has more. Gaokao has always been considered a life-changing event for Chinese people. In the past, having a college student was an honor for the family. Getting into a good college not only represented better knowledge, but also better jobs with higher incomes. But nowadays, more young people are realizing their higher educational degrees cannot guarantee them higher paid jobs. Also, many jobs require less academic achievements, but more vocational training. However, due to misconceptions about the value of university degrees in the job market, vocational schools have not been popular. We have entered the era of universal tertiary. Twenty years ago, the gross enrollment rate of higher education was 10 percent, but now it's close to 60 percent. Many people did not realize this issue and still believe that a higher academic degree represents higher income. However, in reality, if you lack high skills and abilities, it is also difficult to gain favor in the job market. China has been taking countermeasures to the aimless pursuit of high academic diploma. It has canceled extra academic tuition classes and revised laws to develop vocational schools, hoping to divert students to fulfill the needs of job markets. Actually, our universities serve different purposes. If you choose an elite education, then in the short term, it should not be oriented towards employment, but rather focus on academic and research pursuits. On the other hand, vocational colleges are oriented towards meeting employment demands, so they aim to develop students' job skills. Therefore, education and employment cannot be equated. 
All occupations are equally respectable, in fact. If a child is not suitable for academic study, he should not feel bad about going through vocational school and being able to establish himself in the society even earlier than the academic students. While parents are becoming more practical, they still hold high expectations about the academic achievements of their children. I think liberal arts education is very important to one's development. My kid will start picking specific industries and fields during the master or doctoral program. So I hope my child would study AI for undergraduate and explore its application during the master and doctoral program. Gaokao is still considered the most difficult test in the world and it has been portrayed as an army of thousands of men crossing a single log bridge. But experts say there's much needs to be done to reform college courses and to provide more high quality vocational education. Perhaps in the future, Gaokao may not be as intimidating as students have various ways to fulfill a life. Wu Surei, CGTN, Beijing. China has implemented the Common Prosperity Workshop program to increase the income of residents in underdeveloped counties, particularly in mountainous areas of Zhejiang province. The new program has helped to create community jobs for local residents in a more flexible and effective manner. And to understand the workings of this program, we visited Chunnan County in Hangzhou City and Wei County in Jinghua City. The resident of the Shu Guan community in Hangzhou City's Chunnan County dropped off her kid at daycare in the Commonwealth Workshop Complex early in the morning before starting her job in the workshop on the second floor. As a mother of two, Ms. He said that she is very satisfied with her job as it offers her flexible working hours at an hourly rate, which accommodates her needs as a young mother. The provision of community jobs is a huge help to young moms like me. We can work while also able to take care of our families. This year, Chuan'an County has initiated the Zhejiang Province's first Common Prosperity Workshop complex in the Shu Guan community. While providing better child care and elderly care, the complex has set up two workshops to produce textile and stationary products. The two workshops has recruited more than 150 local residents, providing each of them with a monthly salary of up to 3,000 yuan. This year, we plan to spend more than 3 million yuan on wages, allowing us to create more than 200 job opportunities within the community. The employed women were weaving Chinese knots at the Women's Commonwealth Workshop in Tanhong Township of Jinghua City's Wei County. With the help of the county's Women's Federation, these products will then be sold to the wholesale and retail outlets in the city's Yiwu County and Dongyang County. The workshop has integrated the resources of 17 handicraft shops in Tanhong Township and provides jobs for more than 200 local women during the slack season in farming. We provide skills training programs for the low-income farmers and the wives whose husbands work away from their hometown so that they are able to work in the community and increase their income. Wuyi County has so far established 30 women's common prosperity workshops whose functions include the processing of materials, agricultural cooperation, as well as the collaborative development of villages and enterprises. The local authorities also organize women to visit Yihu and Dongyang to acquire the skills that are required in the workshop. Up to now, more than 5,000 women have been able to increase their incomes as a result of these efforts. And with that, I'm closing out this edition of Global Business here on CDTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lily Liu in Beijing. Till next time, bye for now.